yeah, we're gonna have fun. I know the people on this stage. Um, I don't know much about artist development as I'm not in it myself, but I think we can have quite a interesting discussion. So I'm gonna ask everyone to please go ahead and introduce themselves and just give us a bit of background of where, what, how you are in the industry. And then we'll take it from there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kerry Friedman, and my background is artist development, artist management, uh, early days Tananas, which Gallo, I'm sure, will remember. Um, other artists, Tomorrow Day, Freshly Ground, Hunter Blue, um, and handing it on to a superstar now. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Holly Alpha. I show girls. <laughs> My name is Holly Alpha. I'm a female artist from Cape Town. Yeah, and I started rapping in 2016. Yeah, guys. It's okay. It's okay. Cool. <laughs> Hi, uh, Simu Kaimakuna. I'm MD of Gala Music. Yo, Simu, always to the point. Leave us <laughs> on the edge. Okay, right. So, um, we, I know the, the last couple of days, I think everyone's been incredibly exposed to various elements of the industry. You know, we've looked at publishing, we've looked at radio monitoring, etc. But something that I feel is often, it's a very, very big part of um, any record business or record label, artist relationships, artist management. But they, what is there's no sort of formal process of how you get in. You know, if you want to be an entertainment lawyer, you go study law. If you want to become MD of a company, you work your way up. How do you become an artist manager and where does it start? And then also why? Um, well, my background was I accidentally fell into it. I was taking a gap year between doing my honors in criminology, got a little part-time job at a music agency, the band Tananas was being put on by the agency at the VNA Waterfront Theatre. First job in, and there was a phone call from the band saying, please come down to the theatre, there's a big issue with the PA. So I went dashing down and I wanted to speak to the PA, the manager person at the theatre, for the band to inform me, actually, it's the sound system, <laughs> it's the gear. So that's where I began. I fell in love with the band, I fell in love with their music. And a couple of months later, they asked me if I'd look after them, uh, be their manager. I was okay, but I'm starting my criminology next year. And then we got an invite to go to Midem, which I'm sure Antos will <laughs> remember. And literally it was, Two weeks in Midham, which overlapped, Midham is in Cannes, which overlapped the commencement of my honours, and I just chucked my honours in, and starting a band, baby. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Kerry. I'm going to, um, I want to come back to what you said. So, often you hear that people are sort of thrown into these kind of careers, particularly in this industry, but what um, sort of qualities or requirements do you need as an artist manager to ensure that your artist is, you know, not only well looked after uh, mentally, et cetera, but taken care of financially, taken care of in terms of understanding exactly what contracts they're into? Because I know there's an, this expectation that the label oversees that, but in a label there's an artist representative that kind of functions in a managerial uh, sort of aspect, but isn't actually a manager. What are the responsibilities of an artist manager? Um, in South Africa, we take on a lot, lo a lot more larger functions than overseas. Overseas, artists are very lucky. They have a personal manager, business manager, tour manager, uh, a PR manager, because our industry is still so small in finance and earning capacity, you'll often find a manager is taking on the role of, of, of all of those titles. Um, so it's learning on the job every day. Never assume you've got the answer. Fat check all the time. Um, I heard ye in yesterday's sync discussion where Mark said, if a manager says, yes, you can have the track and license it, don't believe the manager. A manager's job in that situation can never and should never assume 
taking control of an answer on the band's creativity. Um, it's really important, open communication, always going back to the artist, um, having an incredibly thick skin, it's tiring. If it's a live performance, you're working through the day, you're on the gig at night, you finish the gig, you're then doing finances, um, you get to sleep at maybe three in the morning, you're then waking up at five because you've got a plan to catch to Dubai and one gig there and flying straight after the gig back to another country or another city. Um, having, you've got to have a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just have to have a sense of humor. Um, also, as a manager, you are the fallback guy. And a lot of bands will set you up as the fallback guy. So if something does go wrong, it's, uh, it's my manager's fault. Um, taking on the labels, <laughs> questioning royalties, taking on the publishers, and when I say taking in, on having that open line of communication, being able to discuss, there's a query in the royalties, there's a misunderstanding in a statement sheet. Um, so you're never assuming that whatever you receive is as it is. Um, sure, it, it goes on, it, it, it goes on, but it's, it's, a, it's a thankless job, uh, that I promise you. And when things are going really good, it's still thankless because you're going on to the next gig. Um, but the most important thing is you've got to have passion. You have to have passion for the artist, the music, a love and a camaraderie and the understanding of teamwork is huge. Team, 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 teamwork. Sure, I love that. Um, there's particular um, part of this that I want to get back to because it's a beautiful interaction happening here. We have a manager, we have an artist, and we have a label representative. But I'll get to that question later. I want to ask Coley, so we've heard, you know, Kerry said she fell into, you know, managing bands, which is just extraordinary. For you as an artist, do you have a particular set of requirements that you look at before you pick your management? Or is it more, you know, a friend that's come up with you? Or is it your label appointing someone to you? So when it comes to me, uh, Utando came after Osive, uh, my ex-manager. And um, he, he, he sort of like play, played a role of, we could see, okay, Holy Alpha, I'm just gonna play, I'm, I'm just gonna help you out, you know. You can, you, you can just do you, your music, and I'm gonna shoot your videos. And uh, when somebody who's perfect, who, who says, okay, I'm gonna be your manager, I wanna be your manager, like, the person that you actually choose would you okay, you're good with this one. Then I'm just gonna back off, but I'm, I'm just gonna play a role for now. So like, that's how we it started, Utando. It's, it's, it's like, it's sort of like a brother and sister relationship. We're really close. So it's just happened. He's, he used to manage uh, la, 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 me, uh, so he's got an experience like, yeah. And then based on that, so Kerry, you mentioned that overseas artists, you know, have a personal manager, financial manager, etc. Holy for you, do you, in your relationship with your manager, do you have a very obviously like transparent idea of what's happening, you know, with your sales, etc., with your bookings? Is that relationship very, very transparent? It is very, very transparent. I know every time I'm going to say when the money's in, I know he calls <laughs> your holy. That ching ching is here now. I know everything. I know I know the passwords, the pins. <laughs> yeah, everything is day. <laughs> Guys. So yeah. Okay, that's excellent. I love that. I wanna loop Simu into this. Um because uh, like I mentioned earlier, traditionally there's this assumption that a label has a um, management sort of team that will then be appointed to an artist, but artists often come in with their own individual management. How do you as a label manage that then relationship because you now have someone who obviously has the artist's best interest at heart but might not necessarily understand the full environment or ecosystem of the label. How do you balance that sort of yeah, relationship? Uh, difficultly. <laughs> it's a short answer. Uh, no, so generally the, the best situations is exactly what you've described where someone comes with their own team um, and people looking after different parts of their interests because on the one hand, if you, if you think about what artists are, 
they are the product mm. and yet sometimes they're expected to negotiate on behalf of themselves mm. without feeling some type of way. Like if I'm doing an Excel spreadsheet and you're calling me out on my, some of my formulas, I'm going to feel some type of way about it, right? Mm. Like how do you separate yourself from the creator in one conversation and then you're the business person in the next, it's going to be super difficult. So always better to have people around you who can support. Mm. Um, I, there's a particular part that I want to bring up about this and it's speaking to what Simu said. Where are the contracts in this? Because you know you said it's amazing you bring an, art, an artist as a management team, it comes in, the label and the artist have an agreement, they have an understanding. Do you have artist management agreements with your artist? Do you have an agreement with your manager? Like, what is the paperwork? Because I guess then what is the recourse? You know, with the label, if they don't um, reach certain obligations, you can terminate. But what happens if, you know, you and your band that you've been with for five years decide you no longer want to work together? I know. Don't let me start. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely, one should have a contract with your artist. And obviously or the band that you're working with. It obviously depends on the nature of how it began in, in all the years of working <laughs> with Tan and us, and I'm still oversee a lot of their things. Um, we've never had a contract. Um, it was four people that came together and a friendship and a trust was formed and I have had their back and they've had my back. With other artists, absolutely. Contracts are in place, new beginning. It could be a development phase. It's not necessarily um, a lifetime aim for artist and manager to be together. It could just be for a period that that artist needs to get to a certain place and introductions to certain um, entities. Um, but within that, what the artist manager should be advising the band is all the millions of contracts that they should be setting up, um, which is as important. So the, your split sheets with your band members, having a band member contract, because for an artist manager to manage a band breakup um, is, is very fragile and very sensitive, um, a, a leaving band member. So. It's absolutely a contract, and it doesn't have to be a 40-page contract. It could be heads of ag agreement. Uh, this is the expectations of the manager, and this is the expectations of, th of what the artist needs to roll out. Um, your, your manager's as good as your artist's performance as well. If you've, if you've signed up somebody to manage you, um, you need to deliver, get onto stage, produce your music, really be right now, be competitive on social media. Um, there's a lot of expectation that if you record a song and it's a brilliant, brilliant, let's say it's a, you hear it and it's a hit single, it's not just going to go straight to radio. So it's heavy work for the artist and energy in doing the back end, the content creation, pushing themselves. Uh, that in itself is a contract between artist and manager. How you're going to navigate each other's back end. Okay, so um, when it comes to me, uh, me and Tano do not have a contract. It's all about loyalty because I've been with them for like five years now and we've been doing great, like both of us. I don't have anybody else. He's doing everything for me. So, but, uh, but the time goes on, I think that would be a nice, like a good thing to do, to do a contract because you never know what's gonna happen in the future, hey? It's crazy outside, guys. Be careful, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from, I, I think from the business side of things, um, trust is the most important, well, not even just from the business side. In the music industry, trust is the most important currency. And part of that is a positive, but it's also something that hinders the growth of the industry, right, in some ways. And, and I'll explain what I mean. By that is there is no, and I think, Gabby, you made the point earlier, there's no professional track into the music business. Mm -hmm. Like there isn't like, a, oh, I go and I'm going to study my articles and I'm going to do this and da, da 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 that creates that path of like a professional track into the industry, right? It's, it's more about who do you know. 
which is why you can then have situations where there aren't any contracts. But it's bad when when there's a divorce now because then it gets really ugly, right? Because people forget what things were agreed upon beforehand. So I think it's something also that I feel, particularly in South Africa, that needs to be addressed in other parts of the African continent is just a, a, a professional track into management, into some of the support work that helps the artist be the artist. Yeah, can I add? Uh, also, I think a lot of, there's such a, a, a barren land of artists being having access to contracts yeah. uh, without having to go to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, it's very expensive to go to a lawyer. And so the, the notion to even spend that amount of money drawing up a contract to get your manager to sign or your agent to sign, um, is it's a deterrent. Um, so there, there's a whole landscape where, where contracts need to be made far more available at a far more cost-effective price. <laughs> Are there any lawyers in here? I think they must be shaking right now. Like, no, gatekeep. Um, Kerry, you mentioned earlier that, you know, um, a manager sort of fulfills the functions of being a legal counsel, you know, being a promoter, um, I guess knocking on doors when money hasn't come in. In this day and age, artists, I would say, have the most accessibility. You know, there's social media, you can go online and Google what a standard distribution contract should look like. Um, you can basically self-manage. It might not be sustainable the bigger you get. So particularly in South Africa, I'd like each of you to answer, what do you think the actual role of artist management is now in terms of the development of artists knowing that they are able to do pretty much everything on their own almost like you know what is the point of a label anymore but we won't get into that because that's another panel <laughs> but yeah <laughs> I'd like everyone to answer please if a, a young newbie artist approaches me and says I need management in fact I was approached last night I need management and I say well what do you need management for I need you to hook me up with an agent and a record deal and a publisher and get me gigs. My response will be, no, you absolutely don't need a manager. You need to get into the trenches. You need to go and hang out at live venues. You need to hang with fellow tribe musicians and on the live side, on the business side, the record label side, on the publishing side, you need to get your music out there get traction on social media. Once you have traction, I would, s and also by doing all of the efforts, you are learning the business. It's so, for me, it's so important that, art, that an artist understands the business side, and by doing it on your own initially, you'll have at least some sense of the business side. Management can kick in when things become really busy, and it is completely taking away from the artist's creativity. Um, but I, I can't stress enough how important it is for young artists to to get into the trenches on the business side. And, and, and there's so much information online. Uh, you can Google what is a split sheet. Google, and, and you don't have to have a manager. You can send managers questions and say, uh, I don't understand this and I've, I've received a contract or I've been offered a gig. I don't really understand that term of, of uh, the contract that they've sent me. You don't need a manager to answer those questions. You need to, to treat yourself with self-learning um, to put yourself in a position also that you can query your manager. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so I, my journey to the music industry came from business first. So I tend to view the world of music through the lens of business. And when I came into the music business, everything felt like alchemy. Like, oh, you just go into the studio and then you put a track out, it's a hit, everything's work. So I, I tried to figure out a framework to help me fig just to understand the space. Easiest way for me to think about it is being a musician is like starting a, a new business. You as the artist are the brand. So let's say we're Apple. Apple starting today. The brand is Apple, we've designed the logo, we've created the thing. Your first product or your first project is your first product. So we're creating the iPhone. Okay, cool. 
I've created the iPhone. But who's the phone for? What is the phone going to do? How many people are interested in phones? How many people, how big is that market? How are you going to get that phone into people's hands? Same thing with a song. What genre of music are you in? How many people listen to that genre of music? How do you create? How do you get your music to those people? Right? That's the starting point. So for me, management is the facilitation of that process. In the absence of the person not being able to do it, they, they will help you and kind of guide you um, to Kiri's point earlier. But it's, it's essentially managing the process of creating a new product and a new mm. brand, which is the track and the music that's coming out. No, hold on to that, Mike. Oh, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> so we've spoken about management quite a bit. I want to talk about development because I think they go hand in hand, but they're quite separate. So I'm putting you on the spot, and, and by no means this is for all labels. Do you think that South African labels are actually contributing in any way to artist development, particularly now in an era where majors will scoop an artist who's already blown up independently, bring them into the label, shelve them, and then the artist doesn't really go anywhere. Do you think that we have the structures within our you know, music industry environment to actually facilitate development? And then I guess actually maybe you could tell us what does artist development actually look like from a label perspective for you? So short answer is not everything is working, it's broken. So there are some instances where the path through the labels is the best. There are other instances where it actually makes more sense to be independent. And now more than ever, you have many more tools to be independent. The label system, in effect, what labels are there for is a marketing and distribution machine. That's what a label effectively is. That function is still needed regardless of the, the, the structure or the, the journey of that artist, right? But a couple of things have changed. There's a, a, a guy who writes fantastic about this topic. His name is Ben Thompson. Talks about what's called the great unbundling. And essentially, it's how the CD used to be, the CD or the LP was bundled together, music bundled together. So everything about our business used to be structured around how this thing is created and bundled <coughs> and sold. Napster comes, it's unbundled, because now you can get songs individually. And the internet also then means you can distribute or get to your audiences by yourself. Yeah. It's not presenting people with options. So I'm saying, I say all of that to say, on the one hand, you still need the marketing might of a label um, in some instances. But sometimes the artist has a bigger um, social media following than the label itself. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the situation of that artist um, and what's going on. But it, broadly speaking, across the world, the model is not working. It's not just South Africa. Yeah it's, not, yeah, it's not just South Africa ever. I actually think in some respects we might be ahead of the West in certain aspects. But Holy, are you ready to talk? I'm ready. Are you good? So <laughs> um, I want to ask you, as an artist, um, you know, Simo mentioned that artists are like, you know, the product. Artists are, I would say, in this moment in time, probably have the most, um, what's it called, advantage than it's been previously purely because of the access to information, because of the digital era where you don't necessarily need a label to put your music out there. Mm. Not saying to be successful, but to actually get your music out, you no longer require a label. What do you ever think about your development in relation to you know your manager? What does, for you as an artist, having someone, a manager next to you, beside you, what does that development look like for you? All right, so um, when it comes to me, um, social media plays a huge role in us. You know, it gives birth to stars. Um, you can just um, take a, a brand and the next day you're part of that brand, just like Puma, just like Redbird. That's like, just like I did with Puma and Redbird. So um, when it comes to music, uh, TikTok is there. Yeah. Um, that's how you promote yourself. I sing along. I make sure Guti Mama my hooks are sing alongs because I rap in Kosa. They that language is very hard, but fit. So I click 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 dog. <laughs> Come on. So I make sure Guti my hooks are very catchy, and I, I make sure Guti people you know like they they do it on that thing, you know. They I I make sure Guti they, they the interest is there, you know. So we have TikTok buffet too. We have. Um, we have Instagram, we have Reels now, and right now. They, 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 once you post it, Reels, go, 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 every time, the, the, the fan base is growing. Mm. I mean, so, guys, it's there. And even the 
the labels. Oh, ambish. <laughs> guys, ambish. <laughs> ambitious Entertainment once commented on my <laughs> on my TikTok and they called me medium closer. I, I was not okay about that because they's big closer and they called me medium closer and I was like, oh, you're looking? Okay. Yeah. It's here. Okay. They, sh- they, they, they see me. They see me. And I was like, okay, cool. I don't want you guys. But <laughs> I'm good. I don't want you. But uh, yeah, social media is there, Buffett. So let's not play with it. So... Sorry, yeah, do you want? Yeah, yeah, so, yep, so, yep, 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 yep. Yeah, I'm so, loving this conversation. Let's yeah, no, so wanted to pick up on on, on the social media aspect and, and in development, right? I, I think it's super important for people to understand what social media can do for you and what it actually is. Yeah. For me, social media is, in fact, putting a product out and the product being the music is like a bucket with a hole in it. You need to find people to put water into the top of the bucket, which is your fans, potential people who might stay and listen. But the whole is people who are maybe not interested m- might yeah. disappear, right? Social media is a way of putting a lot of water into that top of that bucket. But two things. One, the audience is not always yours mm. because you have to pay for 80% to access 80% of it. So how do you be clever and use hooks or things that will increase the amount of water coming through that bucket? Mm. Second is, once you've put that water through that bucket, what are you going to do with it? And how do you make sure that you don't have to look for the same people again Mm -hmm. the next time? So this is the importance of owning your own data, having your own website. So using social media as a tool, pulling all these people from there to there. So when you market on email, I don't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. If I've got 50,000 people who are subscribers to my email, that's way more valuable than 50,000 people on social because I don't have to market to these people again. So understanding how the social stuff works and then tweaking it so you can pull the audiences. You set up my next question uh-huh. so wonderfully. Don't worry, I'm not going to put you in the hot seat. Um, so I'm a somewhat of a traditionalist in the sense that I think that we in the industry need to go back to the drawing board of what you know was being done, I guess, in the analog physical era of CDs in terms of marketing. Because we can all agree the market's saturated, streaming doesn't pay out. We've heard this for two days straight. What I want to know, um, and uh, Kerry, I'd like you to start because you started, you've managed Tananas, Freshly Ground, and Hunter Blue. And you've come, <laughs> you've obviously, you know, I would say progressed through the digital age, having come from traditional marketing and then seeing the zeitgeist of social media marketing. And now being viral is almost more important than actually you know, having streaming numbers. Do you think that there is a, a way that those two sort of could coexist using a hybrid traditional model and social media? Or do you, I would actually also like to get, just get a very cool little history of how <laughs> you were promoting stuff in the days where you didn't have Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> so let's start there. And then the second part of my question is, can we hybridize it so that, you know, we're using traditional marketing um, incentives like I don't know giving out flyers. I don't know is that what you guys did back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> Was it flyers? Ten thousand flyers. Like, Tulsi knows, and you know bringing and then bringing it back to you know the current social media. I would say um, if we flip to the early years when there was no digital, um, your biggest gift was getting a, a label deal, and relying on the record company to do all of your marketing. Um, it also was the gateway to blaming your record company for your own failure. Um, if you didn't uh, become successful, um, so it was a fantastic platform to say to the record company, well, you haven't taken our track to, to radio. Why has it been rejected on radio? Why haven't we been um, reviewed in that magazine? Why aren't our posters up? Why aren't you giving us to a support? Um, obviously, it's flip. When the track hits radio and it's a huge success, we love the label, it's the best. Um, along comes digital, and it flips everything on its side with, with the labels. And fantastic, artists can now go on their own, be exposed easily. However, the work now sits with the artist to get themselves out there. Um, and I'm sure you will concur that the amount of energy and time put into creating your content Mm. is insane. Uh, It's a full-time job on its own, and um, it's absolutely 
a different platform to blaming it or relying on the record company for delivering. However, there is one crossover, which for any record company in the pre-digital stage <laughs> uh, and current is they want us to know if you're going to perform live. The, the, your, your income then and now. Live then was selling CDs and was an income for the label <laughs> and for the artist. Live now is the actual payment of a performance, um, which will benefit label and record company. So there's a, the models change, but, but you need the combination of live performance, social media, and at the end of the day, a flippin' good song. Yeah. It all comes down to the music. <laughs> yeah. That's such a good point. I, I, I would add one thing that used to take place that's been forgotten that I think needs to come back. And I'll get to it, which is it's the fan club. But uh, why that's important is what the internet allows now is for you to reach a lot of people at the same time. But in that core audience that you're reaching out to, there's probably 10 to 15% who are super fans. Mm. Who will pay whatever, like if you, if I'm a, let's say I'm a musician and I'm a jazz musician and I decide to put out a documentary on ants, those guys are on it, mm. right? So how do you get to that core audience? And there's a, a guy who wrote a fantastic piece, his name is uh, Kevin Kelly. 2008, he wrote about how the internet allows for um, the 1,000 true fans. Mm. And the business model there, and I've seen this replicated by journalists and, and some people now who, as a tech journalist I follow, I pay $120 a year, so it's uh, $10 a month, US. There's 25,000 of us who follow and pay that newsletter. That's $3 million per year, every single year. Same, now take that thinking and apply it to a fan club where as an artist, you put out your first album, it does great. Your fan club goes to 100,000. You put out your second album, 200,000. And you say, wait, well, who are my super fans? 20,000 people. These are the 20,000 people who will carry you in between albums. Mm -hmm. They'll carry you when you're done with the albums. When you're 17, you put out that Ant documentary. <laughs> they're there. Yeah, like the Rihanna stands who seven years later, we're still like, she's going to give us the album. It's yeah. coming. Yeah. So okay, <laughs> I want to ask, this is a less business-related um, question, I guess maybe more, you know, in the realm of mental health and, you know, artist relations just from like a actual, you know, interpersonal perspective. We all know that creatives have an incredibly difficult time in the industry. It's the nature of, you know, being a creator. How do you, as an artist and as a manager, establish boundaries? Can you establish boundaries? And if that isn't possible, is it a situation where you say, okay, I might not be the best person to manage you, or I might, this might not be a um, beneficial relationship? Holly, you gotta talk at some stage. <laughs> Can you please repeat the question? <laughs> sure. So no, basically I just wanna know, is it possible to draw boundaries with your manager? considering that they oversee so much of your life, and does there come a point where if you cannot have those boundaries where you say, okay, I need to walk away, or this isn't healthy? It's less of a business question and more of just like an interpersonal question between you and your manager, and then carry the other side. Damn, I think, me and, me and my manager, we've been good. <laughs> but we do have those days where, I think it's, it, it, comes when it, it comes when a part of your relationships, you know, you know, some, some people that we date, they don't understand, you know, they don't understand what we do. So, you know, you always told me, Kuti, Alpha, you need to get somebody that will understand you, that is going to play a role in your life. So when, if you're going to get a chunky there, oh, 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 shame, it's the wrong word. <laughs> it's the wrong word to use. <laughs> Just a normal person. Oh, not honest. Yeah, and know me. Yeah. So the, you're gonna go through a lot. Like emotionally, you, you you will lose focus in your way. So, yeah, you always like in a relationship side, so like focus, girl. Don't pay attention to that. You know, because it's gonna kind of like ruin your your music way. Whatever. Yeah, man. Yeah. Come on, dog. Come on, dog. No, no, no. Here, here I'm going to yield to those who have way more experience than I do. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, please answer. Uh, 
again, I, I think it varies. It depends it, on each relationship with artist and manager. You, you read, I mean, recently, Scooter. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> scooter <laughs> departing from and that all. It there's uh, you you can't there's not an it, it's it when it it will can't, it's really really good until it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's right. It's about that. It's really really good, and then it's just suddenly it's not good, and there's a parting of ways. And but if I look at, I think Sting still has his same management team. Um, and a lot of those artists that have really sustained themselves out in, in the pre-digital era that are still sitting very successful now have got the same management. Um. Yeah, one thing you know, I'm not throwing shade, but artists and loyalty, sometimes the WhatsApp groups are on different phones. I'm joking. <laughs> okay, I, I could sit and talk like this forever, but I'm going to open the floor uh, to any questions. Uh, so, over there, thank you. Hi, so my question is, I suppose, more for Simu in terms of, I understand that the label doesn't as such do development or pour money into developing an artist so much anymore. But on the other hand, where does the label actually make their money now with regards to streaming not really being a source of income? Um, yeah, I would assume it would come from booking more than anything, but then in that case, would it not make more sense to get a booking agent in that regard? Because I know, I mean, it's very easy to upload your music and that sort of stuff, and once you're established, you kind of have your own avenues of getting to radio and all of those sorts of things. Sure, so I think it depends on the type of label and how big. So the bigger the label and the bigger the catalog, the more streams that they'll get. So even if the streams are little, the company might make money, but individually the artists themselves might not be making a lot. If it's a small label, then yeah, exactly what you're describing is the issue. Then the majority of the revenue then has to be from bookings, touring, merchandising, or on the management side. There are new tools and new things that are coming in. So even going back to old ideas like the fan club, for example, might be one. But yeah, if if the label is small and the catalog is small, it's going to be tough with stream to make the money just from streaming. We have a question. Uh, I'm just trying the microphone. <laughs> um, great. Uh, so uh, thankful to uh, be in front of all of these amazing people here. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate you, uh, Simukai. Uh, your mastermind that just took notes of the books or uh, the, the the you know <laughs> the readings that you suggested uh, they're amazing they provide great insights my question just goes straight to Kyrie um, I, I were, um, my name is Lissandra once again I am from Mozambique I am the founder of a, of, a, of a platform for development of creative economies um, last year we were funded, uh, we had our seed funding by the Music in Africa Foundation for small fund uh, for Music in Africa Live and we are advocating for the rights and duties, duties of music artists. Sometimes these ones are forgotten, only rights are remembered. Um, but I have a question to you, Carrie. When you say that, okay, the artist can do without a manager, I'm not sure if I agree with that. I'm like, just further pick your brain on that uh, what i understand is that usually when you're dealing because i have also a background that is related to business this is how i come from uh, i'm an economist uh, and also creative um, usually when brands are speaking with someone when a company is speaking to someone they have business terms they need to understand what is going to be the return on the revenue they need to understand if there is going to be an agreement signed and educating the artists in all of this and making sure that they have the acumen, the business acumen, uh, and the persona to, to, you know, to defend themselves in point of a, a company that has like a board of six people, sometimes it doesn't work. I've seen it doesn't, don't work many times. So I'm speaking on that level, uh, Gary. Is this, the opinion still the same? Um, the level that I'm referring to an artist doesn't need a manager would be when you've written one song or you've got a few demos, and you think you need management, it's that very early stage where you're still trying to figure out your, your image, your look, your feel, your, your, your palette. Um, of course, the minute uh, you have something to showcase and you can hook in, 
an, art, uh, an artist manager, that the artist manager can then present to you, this is the artist, this is the artist songs, this is what the artist looks like performing live, I'm gonna send you footage. But the artist manager can't physically get, write the songs, put, tell the artist how to dress, uh, very important. I'm sure you would hate your manager telling you, you need to wear this and that, <laughs> but if you need it, if you're asking, you don't want the record company or... <laughs> so I'm talking at the very beginning uh, where you're putting your, yourself together as an artist. The, the assumption that at that stage that the manager's going to make you famous and I'm going to phone Sipo there and I'm go, oh, <laughs> the first thing he's going to say to me is, great song, can you please send another six? Can you please send me photos? and I'd love to see what this artist looks like live. That is a foundation for an artist to, they don't need a manager to do that. Um, and they don't need a manager going, please send me the clips live, <laughs> please send me. Like, the manager wants to see, the manager wants to train spot. I mean, I'm getting feeds all the time on, on Instagram of, I can see they're sponsored or somehow they just pop into my, my feed and I let's go, oh, that looks interesting and I'll pop on to see who, who she or he or they are. Um, so I absolutely agree with you, 100%. And I'm so happy that you come from the place where Gita, <laughs> okay, One more question. Time, one more. Just one more question. Just one more, yeah. Cool. Actually, I just want to add to Kerry's uh, stuff when she said, when you manage somebody, you have to be passionate. So... I'm going to add to that because I manage, I'm Tulsi Pillay, I manage Vota Kilman. So, uh, I mean, I feel like if you manage someone, you have to be passionate and obsessed, but in a positive way. Because if you're not obsessed and passionate about the person's music, it's no use you managing them because you're going to fail. Like Sting is with, like you said, Sting is still with his management company. I've been with Vota for, what, 16, 17 years. So we worked together, and, being, and you know, he started his career in for, at 44 years old, a flute player, also white, sorry, I, have, I can add that. And we just worked together, like we were saying, like we used to walk, I remember in 2006, with 10,000 flyers at Standard Bank Joy of Jazz and put flyers in the cars, the, wind, um, the windshields of the car with windscreens or whatever. So there's a journey, and I just wanna say something else. When we started, I remember, uh, it, I mean, after like three or four years, we were performing, I think, in Bloemfontein. And one of a very well-known band was performing with us. And the sound was so bad. And I went up to the manager and I said to the manager, the sound is so bad. You need to speak to the sound person. And he, st he told me, who cares? I've got the money in the account already. For me, I was devastated because... For me, if that band is not doing well, they're never going to book the band again. And they're going to just, I mean, get bad reviews. And I went to the band leader and I said, listen, your sound is bad. Your manager is not interested. Go speak to the sound guy. So managers need to get involved too with sound. I mean, we perform internationally. I'm ironing the band's <laughs> shirts in, you know, at backstage and putting it on before they go so they're not creased. We get involved in everything. I mean, we sometimes uh, people book us and we get to venues and, uh, sorry, uh, accommodation. And it's such bad accommodation. We need to spend that extra money to make our band you know, like motivate them to get on stage and play well. So there's so many things that all of us get involved in. So you need to get involved and you need to be, you need to love your, love the music. You need to love the artist. You need, everything has to be love and positive. So that's the only way. And this year we won our second, we, we won our second Grammy. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tolls. Um, Kerry, Holy Simu, I know you weren't expecting to see my face. I'm not Leslie, by the way. <laughs> um, but this was actually a really, really great panel. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing it with me. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing who you end up managing next, where you go, and I'll see you in the office on Monday. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Cool. Thank you to the panel for sharing their gems uh, on artist development and management. We do have a few minutes and then the next session will uh, start. It is going to explore.